And we're live. Good afternoon. It is 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it's 5 p.m. GMT, and it's 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So we have our friend Mark Stanislav. How's it going, Mark? Good. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Um, Mark is uh, currently works for Duo Security, and uh, we've had a, um, a very We've got a, a presentation which has generated a lot of interest today, Eyes on Eyes on Surveillance IP Camera Security. So without further ado, Mark, take it away, and we'll take the usual questions um, and answers at the end. Perfect. Yep, let me get my slides up here, and we'll get started. Is that looking okay? That's looking great. Go for it. Great. Um, so if anyone's not familiar, uh, the Eyes on is a uh, IP camera, so this whole Internet of Things we're knee-deep in right now. Uh, I've had this camera personally for a couple of years and it wasn't too long into owning the camera that I had kind of stumbled across some things that I found to be a little bit weird so we'll we'll dive into that uh, but the eyes on is your typical you know audio video recording um, has you know features like motion and noise alerts so if you're away from a home and something happens uh, you'll get a notice that hey there was a motion alert maybe you should take a look at the video clip um, simple camera Wi-Fi and power and that's all it takes to run um, this camera it's, was actually sold uh, pretty broadly across the world uh, and all your major retailers, so maybe someone on this uh, uh, video right now actually has one of these cameras and that's why they're tuning in to see what happened. So during, during the uh, process of, of noticing this camera had some ports open, so things like Telnet. Now if you're uh, you know, tech savvy, if you see Telnet running on just about anything in 2013, you should probably you know, raise, it should probably raise a red flag for you and wonder why that's there. And that's kind of what happened to me. I saw this uh, device in my network running Telnet and kind of dove into it and realized, you know, hey, it's my IP camera. What's what's happening there and why is that the case? Um, so from there, I kind of decided to dive in and look at, uh, you know, what's the security of this device? What are the threats possibly against it? Um, certainly any time that you can send audio and video over the Internet, there's there's a lot of concern about who may also be able to get access to that device. So starting through this research, uh, one thing that I and most people do when you're looking at a network device is network traffic. Um, in this case, uh, the screenshot you're looking at here is one of the kind of provisioning steps of this device. So the, the camera itself will, you know, bootstrap, start up, and, you know, get put on your network. And one of the first steps of that process is it'll actually send over this um, uh, RSA key pair, so a public-private key pair. And, uh, you know, initially in the research, I saw this blob come over, which is clearly, if you look at the, uh, the lower part of the screenshot, you know, there's a very long encrypted password there. So nothing that I could probably brute force or guess or, or, or otherwise very easily. Um, so at first I thought, hey, this camera looks pretty secure. They're using cryptography. That, that's great. Uh, unfortunately, that's really the, the last time we saw anything per, per security. Um, the trick with, you know, the Internet of Things with embedded hardware is... You know, unlike a computer software program that you install and can kind of instrument with and very easily get access to, what, you know, the firm, you know, the software running, uh, you know, these are closed boxes. The firmware running on them aren't, you know, traditionally available very readily, and uh, certainly the device itself is usually sealed up, whether that's you know glue or uh, you know sometimes they epoxy chips, put resin on them, all kinds of things to deter people from really breaking into the hardware. Um, for my, you know, for my situation, I noticed a that we already saw the admin password was encrypted with RSA, which is not something you really want to spend your time trying to break. Um, B, the web transactions, which you see a screenshot of there, are actually using uh, what's known as HTTP Digest mode, and effectively, what's happening in that mode is it's using a secret key to create these digests. So similar to the fact that we don't know. The um, you know the private key of this RSA uh, equation. We also don't know the uh, you know for for lack of a better term, we don't know the symmetric key of the digest. Um, so that's another problem that we're running into. We also have the opportunity. We know it's running Telnet. We know it's running a web server. So we could uh, try to brute force credentials and and try to guess what that password is for either of these interfaces without knowing any kind of spec. So, for instance, if we knew the password was, you know, A to Z and maybe eight characters, you know, brute forcing a network uh, via, via the network might be somewhat feasible because I didn't know the size of the passphrase or um, the complexity of the, of the passphrase. You know, trying to spend my time doing that didn't seem really, really like a good use. 
And lastly, in, in this at this point in time, hardware hacking wasn't something I was super into, didn't really have any of the uh, hardware you need to get, get into that at the time. So um, I was thinking, what, what other mechanisms do I have to go after? And that kind of led me into uh, the mobile application. What some of you might know is that if you upload a mobile application to the iTunes App Store for Apple, um, that is, when it's uploaded, encrypted. The thing you have to keep in mind, though, is when your iPhone runs that device, it has to decrypt it in order to use it. So there are there are multiple things you can do. Um, some are more complex using tech, you know um, tools like GDB. Uh, some are easier, like on a jailbroken iPhone, you can actually install a tool like Rastacrack or Clutch. And what that'll do is basically load the app, uh, dump it from memory, take off the you know any kind of uh, wrapper of encryption that it would have on it, and now you have a decrypted version of the same app. Um, what we see a lot, especially in I, really the mobile space in general, developers are not really aware of just how much data, how much clear text, you know, ASCII data is actually in their mobile applications. Everything from passwords to API keys um, to, you know, host names, a- a- all kinds of data that really shouldn't get out and the developers probably don't think can get out, but, uh, you know, as an attacker and researcher, we know, we know, we know better and we uh, leverage that to our advantage. So what happens when you have a decrypted, you know, binary in this case, just like any other sort of decrypted uh, application or just, you know, pure binary to begin with, um, you can do simple things like, you know, pass it through a program like IDA. You can run uh, strings on it from a command line and actually just get, you know, clear text to ask you out of it and see what, see what's in there. And sometimes you get lucky. Uh, this is definitely one of those cases where I got very lucky uh, to a concerning point, really. Um, if you look at the uh, really either screenshot, you'll notice that there's data where it's basically a telnet prompt, and that telnet prompt, it, you're actually logging in as root uh, with a password of stem root. So this was hard-coded in the mobile application, and the purpose of this, if you look at the lower screenshot, you'll actually notice that um, there's some shell scripting there, and really what this was there for is to actually bootstrap the firmware upgrade process. So effectively, um, over telnet, using root credentials that are hard-coded on this device, the mobile application would send all this data over Telnet to then start the firmware upgrade process. So a lot of concerning parts to that um, situation. But for us, that's a you know, great, piece of no- uh, great piece of news because since it's in the mobile application hard-coded, we know it's something that affects all devices, not just our device. So very quickly, uh, logging into Telnet once you have a, a root username and password is a very simple proposition. Uh, you can see here, uh, if you've ever you know, done penetration testing or other research, you've probably taken screenshots very similar to these. What's cool is we now know, um, although we probably could have guessed pretty easily before, hey, this is running uh, a version of Linux. It's running on ARM hardware, pretty standard for embedded devices. Uh, we can also see there's a bunch of network services listening. Some of these we were aware of, such as Telnet, such as the web server, but there's also some services that we didn't uh, really know what they were when we were just kind of doing a, a network scan originally. So we gain insight, but now that we're root on this device, we really have kind of the keys to the kingdom because as long as we have that control, we can change the software on the device. We can change the network traffic going in and out of the device. You know, we're, we're at a central point of ownership and keeping in mind that these hard, hard-coded credentials apply to all these cameras on the market at this point. Going through the camera, we kind of look, start looking for some files, uh, further information. One place most people will generally go is the uh, Etsy shadow file, and that shadow file on a, a Unix-like system will actually contain the, um, you know, the hashed version of passwords for the system users. Now, we already knew stem root was the root account, so that's not a surprise. Um, the uh, other two credentials we actually see in there are uh, slash, uh, forward slash admin forward slash and then Merlin. And so the admin, um, the admin username applies to the admin password and the MG3500 applies to uh, the Merlin. And if you look at the last little screenshot at the bottom, taking a Descript password is reasonably easy to crack against. Um, Descript, if you're not familiar, is kind of a standard that had its heyday about 15 years ago. Uh, it's, it's truncated at eight characters, uh, just like all DES usage really was. So if you ever see uh, these kind of really short passwords in here, um, they're, they're much different than even like an MD5 password or SHA-1 password. It's a very finite number of, of potential uh, combinations. 
And if you look on the internet, you can find rainbow tables that effectively will enumerate a lot of these, or you can crack them real time and have very little trouble. Going forward on the system, we can start looking at the web server. Uh, certainly because there's a web server on here, we can make some reasonable inferences that the web server is kind of core to how this device operates, uh, keeping in mind that this camera has a mobile application. So uh, one thing that we know is that the web server is running, um, or I should say the, the, the web server that is running on this device is uh, Light, Lighty or Light HTTPD. Uh, pretty common one to see on embedded devices, a very lightweight web server. So we find out, hey, there's a kind of a typical uh, you know, password, um, HG, you know, password file, and in this case, they have password hashes for user and admin. We're kind of at the same problem we were before, which is, hey, we have password hashes, but we would have to crack them or waste you know, a lot of time, perhaps. The good news is that the camera itself actually has these clear text passwords hidden in, in another uh, config file for Lua. And so rather than having to brute force these passwords or trying to crack them, you know, we can just look at another file in the file system and actually find out what the credentials are. The one that you're probably, you know, having your eyes drawn to is where it says user, user. And this is another case where there's actually a, uh, a default set of credentials that are effectively hard-coded on this camera, which is literally the username of user and a password of user. Um, you know, certainly concerning because, again, this affects all the cameras on the market at that point, and we'll start leveraging some of these credentials to see where that goes for us. The camera itself has a web server that we you know, already kind of knew about. However, from a user perspective, uh, kind of a consumer buying this off the shelf, this is not documented anywhere. This is not in the manual. This is not talked about on documentation online. Uh, this web server is actually there for the express purpose of letting the web application uh, speak with the mobile application. So it's kind of a, a means to an end to share data with that mobile app that you have on your phone that's really kind of doing the heavy lifting for you as an end user. And of course, we can log in with user, user as credentials. So if, uh, if at this point you have access to one of these cameras uh, at this point in time, you would have been able to do the same thing uh, and get, got, got into this web interface. And a lot of information's here just as that default user. You, now you can't edit any of the configuration. However, you can see the full stream of uh, audio and video. You can look at API service keys. So this uh, camera is using multiple services on the back end uh, through third parties, and those keys are exposed. So if you kind of wanted to go around the camera, you could actually perhaps interact with those APIs directly uh, using the keys of someone that you're logged into, uh, you know, logged into their camera. And then also firmware details, configuration about how the alarms are set up. So if we look at this next screen, um, one interesting feature is that it shows you uh, that blocked region, the, the horizontal line you'll see there is a little bit lighter, and that's actually where the motion alarm is. So if you are, let's say you break into a camera over the internet, you find a house. If you look at the left screenshot, you can see that there's actually a, a capability uh, to do a wireless scan. Now, certainly this is built in for the, the you know, obvious purpose of when you set the camera up, the device know, needs to know what network to be on. However, in this web interface, um, you can directly see all of the wireless networks around you. Uh, I don't know about your you know, apartment complex mates or uh, someone in your flat, but I've seen a lot of people put their addresses, their family name, all kinds of really personal information in their Wi-Fi network name. So in this case, if you have a Wi-Fi network radius, you have an IP address, which gives you a rough geolocation um, of you know, certainly about a city, and then factor that in with information about the home. Maybe there's an architectural detail. You start getting to the point where you know someone's home, you know where the alarm sensor is for motion, uh, you know what the strength setting is for audio, uh, audio sensitivity for alarms, you have Wi-Fi network data, and you start getting to a point where if you really were a dedicated attacker, uh, perhaps you could use all that data in concert to actually break into homes, steal things, and you know, the homeowners would never be the wiser. Getting more to some of the techn technical aspects, uh, one service that's being used is uh, a company called Intellivision. And Intellivision, uh, what their purpose is for is the process of if there is an alert, so there's an audio or a motion alert in the home, uh, you will actually use them to upload to a uh, Amazon Web Services S3 bucket. And that video is then available for you to look at on your phone if you are away and, hey, want to see what happened with that, that noise alarm. Why did that go off? You know, did your dog bark? Uh, did someone break in? 
So a couple of problems with how they were at this time doing this process. Uh, a, the data was all being done clear text. So none of the data was actually being transmitted securely. So if you were on a network with someone uh, and they could sniff your network traffic, they would be able to see all this data as well. The data was also stored in one Amazon bucket, which traditionally what you would do is actually segment the data per customer. Um, so the problem here is if someone could break into that one bucket, assumably at this point in time, they would have been able to get all the data for all the customers of this, uh, of this vendor, which is a big problem. Uh, Keeping in mind, you know, data security and, and accessibility, these files were actually accessible as long as you knew the URL, and the URL was just an MD5 file hash and then kind of a, a structured file name. MD5, while it's not great for passwords, is certainly a rather large key space for brute forcing, you know, your average uh, kind of use case. So on a long enough timeline, it's possible you could have guessed or brute forced one of these uh, file paths. But keep in mind, none of this had authentication. So if you found a URL and just stumbled upon one accidentally or through a lot of effort, uh, you would be able to see the video. It's not encrypted at all when it's uploaded. It's purely over the internet um, as is. Uh, there was one other thing that I never tested because that would be a, a big violation of many laws in America, but um, the, the mobile app also did have some hard-coded credentials for Amazon S3, um, so the API keys for that. Now, um, again, I can't speak to whether or not those were the production API keys, but certainly it's concerning whenever you find hard-coded API keys that, that deal with something as important as the video and audio for customers. Another vendor, and getting back to this web interface, um, Yoikes is actually a company that was used to stream video from the web application running on your camera to the mobile application. A couple things to know about here, and I apologize for truncating that screenshot a little bit, but the actual video stream that you're looking at on your phone is literally being kind of reverse proxied from your home to wherever your mobile phone is, and that's all being done at this time over clear text. So none of this video being transmitted is actually being encrypted over the network. This is a big problem, uh, well, aside from the you know, fact anyone can snoop on that video, but also because if someone could break into the web application, um, they would actually have a direct link back into your home network. A lot of vendors in the space will actually proxy video to an endpoint in their network, and then you would connect to their server. What this is doing is, is effectively opening a network connection outbound from your network past your, your NAT, past your firewall, past your router, and then exposing it on the public internet, uh, which can, of, of course, lead to some problems if there was a web app vulnerability in this. Um, keeping in mind there is kind of a predictable URL and port number scheme here, uh, whether or not you could guess a port and a URL and get access to a camera, uh, I, I think they probably lock that down from just you know, letting anybody into the camera. However, that's one of those things that it's a bit of a risky proposition and certainly not something that most customers would want to want to see or hear about. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview of some of the issues. Um, I want to spend a, a minute or two on this graphic because it, it's hard to go over every little detail about vulnerabilities and, and best practices. Um, you know, keeping in mind the Internet of Things and how many of these devices each of us will probably own over the next few years, um, you know, this wasn't a bad company. This wasn't a, a brand new company. They had, they had senior people here that had other experience at other tech firms. Um, but if you really look at the number of issues that this one device had, you know, keep in mind how many of these devices you're going to be putting on your network soon, and um, imagine if one of these issues affected one of your devices. A lot of times in, in the Internet of Things, we're kind of trusting that, you know, vendors have locked things down pretty tightly on the Internet. What we do see, however, is that once you're on a network with some of these devices, the security level drops dramatically. So keep in mind, if I could break into the eyes on camera, and you have about a dozen, dozen other devices on your home network, um, a lot of that local network security is actually, actually a lot weaker than some of the internet-facing components. And that could actually lead to some problems if, uh, you know, if you have some other devices that may have some attack surface. So everything from um, you know, things we didn't talk about, like the firmware that we, was used in this device was actually kind of an off-the-shelf firmware. If you recall the username of MG3500 with the password of Merlin, uh, that's actually in every version of that firmware by that vendor. Um, so this isn't, the, some of these issues are not directly just the camera. Uh, they're actually just 
de facto systematic issues with the firmware that was used on some of these chipsets. And that's really where you start kind of, um, I guess, snowballing some issues is you're not just thinking about the web app that you're installing on a camera. You're not thinking about uh, the mobile app that you're using with the camera. You're also thinking about what is this embedded hardware? What kind of risks does that have? What kind of firmware is on here? How is Linux set up securely? So there's a lot to think about when uh, when a company is going to market with one of these devices. And right now, we're really seeing some failures in, in a lot of those areas. One, one thing I'd like to end, end with is uh, a little bit more hope. I know it's, especially if you're a big fan of the Internet of Things, we don't want, to, want you to go out thinking that everything's you know all doom and gloom. Uh, one area that's really interesting about IoT right now is there's a lot of a lot of uh, innovation. There's a lot of small companies, entrepreneurs, companies that are being crowdfunded on sites like Kickstarter, and they're coming up with some pretty cool IoT devices. The problem is if you think about companies that are big, the, you know, uh, like Philips or Belkin, you know, these big companies have security issues with their IoT devices. What hope do some of these smaller vendors that have a team of one or two and maybe don't have really any security knowledge? Uh, what chance do they have to go to market with a secured IoT device? Um, so collectively, uh, myself, um, another researcher from Duo Security, started this initiative called Build It Securely. So it's a website to builditsecure.ly. And we're doing two things. Uh, one is we're actually curating resources. So if you're a developer in the IoT space, you can go to our website and kind of go to the bottom, and you'll see here's a slide deck about um, you know best practices for REST APIs. Here's a white paper on uh, security practice for iOS development. And hopefully through some of these curated resources, at the very least, you'll have some options to read and learn and hopefully uh, gain some knowledge that you maybe didn't have going into building an IoT device. And really where a lot of our time is spent is we're actually partnering with a number of vendors in the IoT space, uh, focusing on smaller vendors because they need a little bit more help than everyone. Uh, but we've been kind of open-armed uh, to companies that are bigger and that actually do have security teams but still care about security enough to work with us to try to get more out of, um, out of research. And if we move to this uh, next slide, excuse me, you'll see kind of this mishmash of names. Now, this represents uh, vendors. So you'll see Dropcam, Belkin, uh, Zendo, which is actually a stealth IoT startup right now, uh, Pinocchio, Dipjar. These companies are IoT companies, uh, both products and platforms, and they're actually working with us where we hook them up with, with researchers at companies like LabMouse Security, IOActive, NCC Group, Excipiter, Attack IQ, and before they go to market, ideally, we will get more or less beta on the verge of production hardware in the hands of our researchers, and um, for no money, it's completely pro bono, our researchers will do the research that they want to do, They'll give the bugs back to the companies, and hopefully by the time the product comes to market, uh, these devices will be a lot more secure than if they had gone to market before we took a look at it. Uh, we've partnered with Bug Crowd, which is a great uh, crowd, um, really a crowdsourced uh, bug hunting organization, and they're providing their platform for completely free. And we basically had a, a great partnership with you know organizations like I'm the Calvary and Postscapes. And collectively, this you know giant um, you know array of logos represents people that get security. They want to do better if they're a vendor, and they want to um, you know they want to make sure consumers trust them. They want to make sure that when you buy an IoT device for $150, you don't feel like you got gypped because you had to patch it five times the first week it came out. Uh, so researchers get to do research. We get to talk about it. Vendors get um, you know bug reports, and consumers get better devices. So we're really trying to solve a lot of problems here. Um, certainly. You know, we can only scale so much, but, um, you know, looking at, looking at the eyes on camera, uh, STEM Innovation, who's actually the proprietor of that camera, they've, they've since reached out to us, and we're uh, looking at working with them. So hopefully their logo will be on this slide in, a, in the coming weeks. So that should show you, even if, even if a company did have a bumpy road with security, even if it seemed like, you know, they didn't understand what they were doing or, or how security works, um, you know, vendors are very quick to adapt and say, thank you for information. We appreciate the time you took to do this research. How can we work better with the security research community? Um, so I know a lot of times it feels like the vendors are against the security researchers, but uh, this, this screen and, and the, you know, information I just told you about should hopefully give you some confidence that research is important. Uh, we do make progress. We do improve products. And uh, it's, not, it's not all uh, us versus them. There's actually a lot of collaboration happening right now. So... 
Um, we hope uh, you know you'll take take a look at our website, and we uh, invite you to work with us if you think that you have a role with us. So that's all I have. Uh, let me give it back to Max. Terrific. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, if I can get you, that was a great presentation. A lot of a lot of good content there. You know, I always um, we have a lot of people who watch this who kind of aspire to be in positions like you and with the with the expertise you have. Let me just kick off with a question as to what you would advise um, viewers. Uh, in regards to you know sort of uh, let's call them milestones, educational milestones. I mean, what 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 led you to where you are right now in regards to you know having you know this this amount of knowledge and and, and curiosity? Sure, no, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I've done penetration testing professionally. I've been a web developer. I've been a sysadmin. So, um, you know, typically my advice is be as broad as you can, uh, learn as much as you can because. It, it sounds really sexy to break hardware and break software, but until you've actually written software, you've you've you know deployed servers and had them you know have someone try to break into them, you really don't quite understand that you know the 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 red team blue team aspect of that scenario. So uh, my advice is you know get a career that's that's not just security, get a career in being the guy that gets attacked because you'll learn a lot about how uh, how to do things the right way and what not to do. Um, and uh, certainly you know a lot of people on this uh, you know video chat probably have. IoT devices in their home, you know, set up Wireshark. Look at your network traffic. It, you know, is it encrypted? Are the API calls secure? Um, you know, try to see what ports are listening. Very simple things that people can get some uh, good insight about this space, and then also have some cool research projects and hopefully, hopefully, make a difference like we have. Excellent. Um, let me just jump into a question here. Uh, typically, where does the chain break down when it comes to R&D and launching a product from a security perspective? So that kind of sinks into what you were just saying. Yeah, um, what, what's hard is, and especially in the IoT space, you have a lot of companies that have a good pedigree of making technology products, but not internet-connected technology products. So uh, people are really good at making sleek designs, really good at getting small form factors and, and really neat, neat features, but they've really never had to make these things mobile-enabled. They've never had to make them Wi-Fi-enabled. And so they're using the same techniques they've always used, and they're not actually applying kind of the security controls you need around having a network de connected device. So a lot of it's the kind of immaturity of vendors as they move into the IoT space. Um, what's really neat to see, if you look at the eyes on camera as kind of a generation one, it's you know two, I don't know, two or three years old now, um, and now you have a company coming back and saying, hey, listen, we've grown, we've matured, we're looking to do things better. You know, in, in two or three years, we've already had, we're, we're already up to a, kind of a second generation of IoT security. So things are moving fast, and I, I have a lot of confidence that vendors are going to get it right pretty soon. Let's just, I mean, you touched on it um, during the presentation, but uh, the question came in um, was, what sort of response did you get from the vendors? So do you want to kind of take us through maybe like a step-by-step -step of how you approached them, what their initial reaction was, and Obviously, only if you feel comfortable doing so. No, no, absolutely. I think I think vendor disclosure stories are really important. Um, uh, in the case of STEM Innovation, the company at the time, uh, so this is about a year ago now. Um, you know, it was kind of like pulling teeth. Uh, I sent them over emails. Uh, I had to follow up with them. I got very little follow up from their team directly. Um, spent a lot of time kind of trying to hunt them down and saying like, "Hey, I'm, I'm going to publish this research." would like to talk to you, here's my findings, let's talk with your security team or your engineering team, and just really got no, uh, no initiative on their side that they wanted to interact with me. Um, you know, fast forward a year, they have some new, new blood in there, some people that understand security a little bit better, understand security research, and certainly saw that um, you know, the findings in my presentation were, uh, they've all fixed them now. So all these issues are, have been fixed. Um, I published the research uh, with about two months warning to their team, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, my my caveat for any research would be try to coordinate with the with the vendor. Um, you know, surprising people only hurts consumers. You should give them at least some time to try to fix these issues. Uh, but if vendors are unresponsive, keep in mind that just because you found these issues doesn't mean you're the first people to have uh, ever found these. So it's not that you putting the research out there publicly is actually you being a bad guy. Uh, you actually might be protecting re, uh, pr protecting consumers by giving them information to make the intelligent decision. You know, it's like having a car recall. Um, would you rather know that the brake pedal sticks every so often, or be not told that because you're worried that someone might try to force it to be stuck? It, it, you know, knowledge is power. You should give consumers the option to turn their camera off and not kind of be in danger. So, um, you know, 
bad response initially. The companies learned they've grown. They've got some new uh, new talent in there, and mm-hmm. now they're a much more security forward company. So it, it's you know kind of a good story at the end of it. Nice fun. I like that. Um, and final question that came in here. It's quite a generic one, but uh, hopefully you can nail it. What is the number one cyber threat for devices that are within the IoT space? Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would say at this point, if if I'm going to take a really broad look at I, what we can consider IoT, I would say default credentials. So whether right. that's a default password in firmware, a default password in a web interface, a default mobile password, we, we're, we're really seeing some bad, just bad day-to-day security with these devices. And, and the reason why those are a big deal is because if these devices are network connected and almost always are going to be, that's one thing that if it ships with that defect, it's not like an exploit where you have to have some knowledge or be able to run some shell code. You literally can type a username and a password in and get access to these devices and have full control like we saw today. Um, so that's the thing that really worries me and something that's very, very simple for vendors to fix, so it's really frustrating to see. Terrific, Mark. That was a, an excellent presentation. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time, sharing your expertise with us, and uh Good luck and continued success, and I hope we can get you back on again soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, and thanks for all the questions, everyone. Cheers. You're a gent. Thank you so much. Have a good one, Mark. Okay, bye-bye.